All right, so this is uh, a mock interview with Rishi uh, Poptani. Uh, Rishi has close to 10 years of experience uh, working in the capital markets domain uh, as a programmer analyst and as a business analyst. And uh, the purpose of our conversation today is to get to know Rishi a little bit better and to understand some of the experiences that he's had as a business analyst. Uh, so with that said, welcome Rishi to Thank the you. mock interview. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right. Uh, so, uh, Rishi, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of, I've had a chance to go through your resume, and uh, I see that you do have quite a bit of experience in the domain that uh, is uh, being interviewed for. Uh, what I'd like for us to do is to really just kind of get to know each other a little bit, and then we'll just dive into the, the contents of your resume a little bit more. So, uh, sure. I'm wondering if we can start that off uh, with you just telling me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, so, as you uh, pointed out, I have uh, over nine years of experience as a business analyst. Mm -hmm. Most of it has been in the capital market space. Mm -hmm. uh, in my most recent project, I was working with one of the leading investment banks uh, in Europe. Uh, and I was part of their IBOR implementation. I was the lead business analyst for a software that uh, was responsible for the submission of interest rate benchmarks on a daily basis. So the bank that I was working for uh, is on the panel that's, that makes regular submissions to benchmark administrators. And okay. that's why uh, this, this software is not only critical from a functional or an operational perspective, it has a reputational risks associated with it as well. Absolutely. So that seems like a, that seems like very. Um, it's, it seems like one of those those types of projects where there's a lot of pressure to make sure there aren't any major mistakes, especially with reputational yes. risk is involved yes. here. Uh, so that's great, and we'll get into uh, your experiences as a as a lead business analyst a little bit uh, a little bit later on. So that's a that's a great interview. Uh, that's a that's a great first answer to uh, that question. Um, can you uh, kind of just give me a little bit of an overview of uh, the, uh, uh, throughout all of the projects that you've been through, uh, mm -hmm. w you know, there are uh, certain types of projects where you can be on where things tend to go very smoothly. And undoubtedly, if you're involved in any kind of IT project, uh, you're always going to be involved in a project where things don't go as smoothly. Yeah. Uh, from your own experiences, uh, have you had any situations where uh, things haven't gone as smoothly? And can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you did in that project? Yes, uh, the way I look at it, uh, I am only able to make a living because things don't go smoothly. Because if they did, I, mostly I, I, people like me wouldn't be required. Uh, I, I don't mean to be a firefighter. But what I'm trying to say is uh, the kind of work that business analysts do uh, is fraught with ambiguity, right? So, um, and the risk is even more when the, um, when the projects deal with uh, really important things uh, like IBOR submission or the implementation of a major regulatory platform like MIFID 2. Um, so on a, on a regular basis, I'm faced with uh, the typical issues that business analysts face. Uh, for example, uh, difficult or recalcitrant stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, people, um, or I would say stakeholders who are not clear exactly on what they want. Yeah. Uh, they know why they're doing something. Uh, in some some cases, not even that, but mostly I've been lucky enough to work with stakeholders who, who've got their business drivers sorted out, but um, they it, it becomes very difficult for them to prioritize their uh, needs. So that's a frequent challenge. And those those priorities, even once decided, keep moving up and down. Right. So right. that's something I have to, uh, to deal with. Uh, secondly, being at the crux of... Uh, uh, the development process, the software development process. Um, I have to deal with uh, development teams, with QA professionals, deployment professionals, uh, DevOps guys, right? And all of these guys have their own uh, timelines, their own agendas, and in a lot of cases, their own motivations. So to balance all of these, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that is common, that uh, that's, that's something I've experienced in all my projects. Right. So. I would say that these two uh, are, I would say, yeah, these two are the, the biggest challenges that in general I've faced in my career. Yeah, that's actually great because uh, that answer kind of really, uh, your experience really shows through in that answer because what I'm hearing there is that 
you've had the experiences where you're dealing with a lot of uh, stakeholders who are not totally clear about their own needs, first of all. Uh, you'll have oftentimes stakeholders in organizations where you'll have um, the stakeholders that you have on your own project are going to have competing needs. You'll experience those types of situations on a lot of projects. And uh, what I've also noticed in what you're saying here is that you actually have full lifecycle uh, implementation experience because if you're working with the DevOps teams, for example, that typically means that you are working to move things from one environment to another. And so you're not just doing the upfront business analysis work, you're actually working full life cycle across, uh, across the entire development life cycle and delivery yeah. process, which is, which is very good. Uh, just cycling back to um, the idea of working with uh, stakeholders who have uh, let's say very unclear needs. Um, do you, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your approaches to dealing, let's say, with a stakeholder who, uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, much more senior stakeholders who are at the strategic level, a lot of times they have a good sense of the direction that they want the organization to go in and they understand their own uh, business needs at a high level. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what you do with stakeholders like that to help them understand what their more detailed requirements might be uh, and to help them kind of clarify their own uh, understanding of what it is that they need operationally? Sure. Uh, so typically what happens with uh, fairly senior people is that, uh, as you said, they, they know uh, very vaguely what they want, uh, but they're not quite sure how to go about it. And in some cases, they might have a set of priorities which they want to pursue, but they're mm -hmm. not quite sure of the order in which they are to be pursued. That's right. So uh, some techniques or tools that I, I've used successfully in the past uh, are, uh, there's a set of prioritization techniques. So there is something called the $100 technique. So I hypothetically speak to them. First, list out, uh, say, the top five or six things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Brainstorm. I, I will not counter question anything that you say let's just write down whatever you whatever comes out of your mouth right. um, and then uh, if I gave you a hundred dollars right now and ask you to spend it on just the top four out of these five or six uh, what would be the amount that you would allocate to each of those four and which ones would you leave out that sort of gives me an idea of what what they are subconsciously prioritizing but not able to probably get through immediately. Yeah, that's one. Uh, second is uh, we use something called quality function deployment. It's something that uh, is 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 very time consuming, mm -hmm. and that's why it's used only when your traditional approaches don't don't have traction. So things like let's do a cost benefit analysis. So if you do something, what is the benefit that you are going to get versus what is the risk? or the loss that you face if you don't do it. Right. So a combination of these two things um, often helps us to prioritize. If, um, to take it further, what, we, what I often do is get, it, get some technical personnel involved mm -hmm. and add to this mix the level of technical risk involved. So feasibility with respect to resources that are available, right? that's also important, yeah. which helps us sort of get a very good handle on what needs to be tackled first. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a very, um, it's a very effective prioritization technique that you use to basically give somebody a certain amount of credit and say, you know, what, uh, what things do you really want? Because when yeah. you force a person to really have to allocate those fictional, uh, you know, credits, then right. you really get forced them to to kind of think that, uh, think through their own priorities in a in a very in a very clear way, which is which is very good. Um, now, let's imagine a scenario where we have, let's say, two director level stakeholders on your project and you're really spearheading the uh, scoping of the project and you're doing the business requirements. And uh, now these two directors have a very different priorities of what they want from you. And let's say it, we have an example where uh, there's one director who is really looking for a certain feature in the product that you're looking to deliver but uh, another one of our directors who's on the same project has um, uh, very strong objections to uh, expending the resources needed to deliver that product, uh, to deliver that feature in the product. And they are really trying to get their own uh, items onto the list uh, ahead of the priority. If you're faced with a situation like that, um, what are some of the things that you can do to help resolve that, that situation? 
Uh, yeah, so um, I've faced a similar situation, not not exactly the same, because um, frankly, I've never had the uh, uh, fortune slash misfortune of dealing with two directors at the same time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, pretty, two, two pretty senior people representing competing interest groups. So there was just on my last project where on, on the IBER implementation, uh, there are two groups that are constantly at loggerheads. Mm-hmm. because of the nature of the work that they're supposed to do. That's One right. is uh, the group that is responsible for getting the submissions out on time. Mm-hmm. The second is our internal surveillance group okay. who will do anything to slow things down so as to minimize the risk of erroneous submissions. Got now, it. you can probably imagine why these two guys are all, these two groups are always at, at cross purposes, right? So there was a feature where uh, the submission team head wanted a copy from yesterday feature. So Mm -hmm. the figures that were submitted yesterday could be submitted today. And uh, he was, uh, he was really adamant that we should have it. Right. Mm -hmm. But the, so when when this, when these features were taken to the surveillance group uh, for their validation, uh, they were up in arms. They they didn't want this. They said that uh, if the team is getting paid every day, they should be using their brains every day to come up with numbers. The software is helping them to do that copy from yesterday is uh, not a good feature for several reasons. Uh, yeah. yeah. So obviously arbitration is the first approach. I tried to uh, get, you know, get them on the same table and speak about it. But when it became clear that that was not going to work uh, uh, and I don't claim the credit for this. One of my uh, reportees suggested this. We, we super, uh, we, we sort of refined the idea and we put it to both parties. The idea was, that uh, the submission team would be able to copy from yesterday, mm-hmm. but they would be able to do that only a certain number of times a week. Uh-huh. And, and the number of times that they would be able to do that during a week would be controlled by the surveillance team, depending, on the, okay. depending on the periods of stress for the bank. Right. Yeah. And so in that experience, did you find that both of the parties were, uh, I don't want to say happy, but were they both um, willing to go along with, with that suggestion? Yes, yeah. yes. they were okay. willing to go along and they actually uh, drafted a note of appreciation, which of course I duly passed on to my uh, subordinate. And uh, I was really happy that both parties got something out of it, not exactly what they wanted. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that was one recent example of how uh, we, we dealt with competing requirements. That's excellent. Uh, and it's good to hear that uh, you have um, stakeholder groups negotiating in the way that you did in that case, because oftentimes you'll find that uh, when there are those types of competing priorities, a lot of times the two sides can't come together and they can't really agree on a solution that's as innovative as, as the one that your team delivered. So that's, it's great. Now, let's just imagine a, the scenar- that same scenario, but let's say we didn't have that innovative solution on the table and we just really couldn't get the two teams to agree. Would there be another approach in your mind in handling that situation? Uh, if that hadn't worked, uh, I had only one thing in mind. I was going to uh, escalate this to my manager and ask him to arbitrate. Uh, because he was more likely to, you know, be listened to. Mm-hmm. And this might seem like a vanilla solution, but uh, to be honest, that was the only thing that, that I could have done. Uh, the only other thing that I could have thought of was uh, in in our project, right? It's, it's all revenue driven. So uh, sometimes it's a simple question of who's paying for the feature, mm-hmm. right? So right. if someone's paying for the feature and they're ready to have it delivered and, uh, it's, it's the burden of not executing the feature due to uh, sort of an audit step falls on the surveillance team. Then I would tell them, look, take it up with the, the audit team, or your superiors. If, if right. we produce this feature and they bin it later, then uh, at least it's not in our bucket. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I think that the um, last option to escalate is always the op- option that we have to fall back on a lot of times as business analysts when uh, we've tried everything else, you've tried all the innovative approaches that you can take and you're still seeing that your stakeholders are really not able to come to yeah. some sort of an agreement, then uh, it seems like uh, a lot of times those escalation paths need to exist in the organization and 
uh, your ability to escalate through your own chain of management is usually the right way to 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 get those things resolved. So that's so that's great. Um, I want to touch a little bit on uh, your experience in working with the uh, development and uh, the infrastructure teams in uh, across the different projects that you've been on. So. Uh, software developers tend to have a very uh, unique, I would say, uh, disposition, and they tend to have their own way of working. Yeah. And uh, in most organizations, that's the case. But in projects where you're uh, really developing or you're enhancing these mission, mission critical systems, like the ones that you've had experience working that have massive reputational uh, liabilities possibly attached to them, uh, in those types of situations, the developers uh, tend to have very, very high standards and they have tend to have very high expectations of the analysts that they work with. And so can you speak uh, a little bit to uh, your experiences with that? Yes, uh, I would say that uh, I've been lucky enough to work with some really good developers. Mm -hmm. And because they're very good at what they do, they expect the same level of competence from everyone around them. Mm -hmm. uh, that has generally been the case. But uh, if I had to pick one uh, situation it was uh, my MIFID to implementation, right? Now that was uh, a very high pressure regulatory program that had a hard stop uh, because the regulation went live on the 3rd of January, 2018. So there was no sort of negotiation. We had to get it done. There was a piece on uh, instrument data determination, which was really complex. And uh, the developers uh, were, um, they, they had, they, they had no idea of the complexity, uh, but they were, they worked very closely with me to, uh, to identify what exactly needed to be done. It was uh, a sort of a symbiotic process because I needed to understand the feasibility of whatever I was going to propose. So mm -hmm. I worked very closely with them and there was a, there was a very closed feedback loop all the time. So I would go back to the, to the requirement owners, take the requirements from them, give it to the developers, check doable, check feasible, et cetera. Uh, if, and, and, and because of this, we managed to, to implement or deliver a very crucial piece of functionality uh, whereby the developers also felt a part of the solution. So they were not just writing code, but yeah. they, they, they felt like equally vested stakeholders right from the beginning because their voice was heard. Very often uh, I've seen projects where uh, even when in, in some of my earlier years where I was working with uh, senior BAs and they would treat biz, uh, they would treat QAs or, or uh, development professionals as separate teams and sort of develop silos in their own heads. Mm -hmm. But um, I've consciously tried to avoid that and I've seen that it really helps. Okay, good. That's good. Uh, because those, um, like you said, in many organizations, some business analysts will oftentimes just treat them as a separate team, not really doing a whole lot of consultation as they're determining the business needs and writing their functional specifications. And they will sometimes only consult the development team right at the back end when they think they have everything ready. And uh, not getting that development feedback right up front with a, a lot of what you're producing can oftentimes uh, create problems for you down the line that you're not, you're not going to be able to foresee. So making sure that the development team is looped in all throughout, especially for very complex things where uh, a lot of times the development teams themselves will have a lot of questions that the analysts might not necessarily have thought of. So yep. having that uh, regular interaction with them and making them feel like that they've been heard and that their concerns have been heard is very important for uh, developers, especially in this domain. Um, so uh, just looking at your uh, resume here, uh, so it seems here that you have a bit of a programming background uh, as well. Uh, so you started off your career initially as a programmer analyst? Yeah, that's right. Okay, and so you uh, would you say that in the domain that you're in that um, your development background helps you in, in some ways or do you think that that's something that's, uh, that's just coincidental? No, I would say it's a, it's a very important thing. It's a it's a great asset, uh, two ways. So while I was uh, while when, when I first started my career, I started writing code. Mm -hmm. I realized two things. I, I wanted to be in the industry, but not in this role. I mm -hmm. saw what BAs were doing. I thought that I'm more suited to that. Um, so it helped me in my choice of career. So that's there, of course. And 
um, having written code for a bit and I still write code in some forms. So a bit of SQL, a bit of Python, right? So that helps me understand how they think of problems and solutions. So in terms of data structures, right? right. In terms of how data would be transmitted, stored, viewed, uh, what could be the practical difficulties with something that I'm, I'm proposing? So mm-hmm. I can't just say, you know what, this is the requirement, go do it. It's not my problem. You know? yeah. So uh, yeah, it does help me because I've, I've been on the other side for a bit. Okay, that's great. Um, going back to uh, your experiences as, uh, as a team lead now, uh, let's say if we were in the process of launching a new project that we estimated we need uh, five total analysts for. Uh, and it was in an area that you have strong domain knowledge in. Um, In that situation, do you think that uh, really not really knowing anything about any of the other analysts that are on your team, would you uh, see yourself more as a team member uh, in an initiative like that, or would you see yourself as more of a team lead uh, for that type of an initiative? Oh, well, I think the answer would depend on on a couple of things. Firstly, what is the official position? So, Mm -hmm. It quite it, it could be that um, the four other the five other analysts that are working with me are equally experienced and are uh, equally talented, in, mm-hmm. and there is no clear demarcation as to who's going to report to whom. Right, right. So that that that's one way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Secondly, uh, the pieces of work that we that we are assigned individually. Mm-hmm. Obviously, at some point we would sit around a table and and share what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Share each other's pieces of work. Right. If it became clear that those pieces are pretty independent and can be analyzed independently, completely Mm -hmm. insulated from the others. Then uh, the question of leading as such doesn't really arise. But if it seems that uh, there's a lot of synergy between the the points uh, and uh, by just consultation, we realize that, you know, one of us, it could be me, it could be someone else really has the knowledge to fast track this then I'd be more than happy to follow or lead as the case may be. Okay. Okay. Uh, if I was to rephrase that question, let's say in a slightly different way, um, let's, uh, let's imagine that we're uh, in the um, inception phase of the project where we're still trying to get an idea of what the scope of the project is. Uh, would you be comfortable uh, in a setting where it is your responsibility really to scope out the project uh, and to have another analyst or another two analysts, let's say, uh, that would be reporting to you uh, where they would be more responsible for doing the detailed specifications uh, when the time comes. So during the inception phase of the project, typically what you're doing is you're just having them kind of tag along with you to listen to the conversations, knowing that the ramping up that you're doing of these, uh, of these other analysts uh, on your team possibly uh, that you're going to need them to produce a lot of the detailed specifications with yep. the with the knowledge that they've gained in in doing the inception with you. Uh, uh, would you be comfortable in an environment like that? Are there some things that you can tell us that you think would help you carry out a role like that? Yes. So, um, of course, I would be comfortable because I've done that before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what would help me right off the bat is uh, to get the scoping done as quickly as possible, because I realized that uh, the scope once decided is never supposed to change, but almost always ever it, it changes. It, it mm-hmm. never remains the same. So uh, use your context diagrams, use your uh, uh, feature lists and whatever it is that you have to do. Uh, I would get the scope done first uh, and, and done it really fast. Share it with the team, with the two people who are going to be specking it out in, in greater detail. And uh, once I know, uh, once I get feedback from them, how, how easy, how difficult it is to spec it out, to flesh the details out, to actually get functional testable requirements. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I think uh, I would use that feedback to refine the scope further. So sometimes it, 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 this has happened to me before where uh, the scope as is got from a customer sort of starts creeping on its own when mm-hmm. it's detailed out. Okay. Uh, so in an environment like that, you'd be happy having two or three or one or two analysts tag along with you in these scoping sessions to, to help them 
a long end. Um, yeah. Really, part of the trouble that you may run into in this situation is that you may have some analysts that um, who are possibly trying to get into too much detail too quickly. Uh, it, yeah. we, and we, with stakeholders, you often want to make sure that you're carrying out the right level of conversations with the right people. And uh, sometimes you may have to uh, make sure that your analysts that are on your team are not kind of pulling the conversation in, in, the, wrong, uh, in the wrong direction or too level of detail too quickly as well. Um, yeah. So that's good. Uh, I think those are all of the questions that, uh, that I had with you. I want to thank you for uh, attending uh, this interview. And um, is there anything else that uh, you'd like to add uh, before we conclude? No, uh, it was great uh, speaking to you, Iman. Obviously, I've seen a lot of your work on, on BA blocks and I think it's, it's fantastic what you're doing uh, because there are, there's a lot of material out there which is available for intermediate or advanced business analysts. But a lot of material on your site is a great introduction for someone who wants to get into the field and has no idea about what to do. Oh, so, that's great. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, okay. it's, it's really good. And uh, I, I appreciate this chance uh, to, to speak to you. Uh, so yeah. thank you for your time. Yeah, that's good. And this was excellent, by the way.